Hi, and welcome to Dark Window. I'm your host, Jim Mann. Here on this program, I will be talking with many of the leading investigators, researchers, and authors on the topics of UFOs, UAPs, alien abductions, extraterrestrials, and a host of many other fascinating and related topics. So please join me and my guest for the next hour as we reach out. This is Dark Window on KGRA Digital Broadcasting. And hello, everyone. Welcome to Dark Window. I am your host, Jim Mann, and along with me is my uh, program manager behind the scenes, Patricia Wilkinson. And tonight in the studio, again, I have uh, Michael Schratt. Michael is a, an aviation historian, a UFO investigator, and this is actually part three of our crash retrieval series. So, Michael, welcome. Huh, good to be with you, Jim. Good to be with you, Patricia. Yes. Mm -hmm. So, uh, the last couple of uh, series are we're doing a series in the last couple of episodes here. We we talked about um, um, well, last week was uh, was Roswell, and then the week before that, we talked about some I know some amazing things. Michael, you're just loaded with information. Uh, huh? Well, it's, I hope so. That's what we do. Who was here, the first? So. Who was the first person we did? Remind well, me. Well, we 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 got in a little bit about Leonard Stringfield. 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 Yeah. Yes. A little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, and tonight, uh, is there anything uh, you want to put up front before you? Who are we mm -hmm. talking about tonight? Or we can just kind of get into it here. So. Just kind of, okay, that's that's yeah. perfect with me. But yep. This is all crash retrieval stuff. And yep. uh, Michael, by the way, has got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of photographs, enhanced drawings, and information to share with us. So, Michael, let's get with it. Um, All right. You're going to put a presentation up. Yep. So let's go ahead and share screen. Share screen. Okay. Entire screen. Share. All right. Now let's see if that works. So are you seeing this, Jim? Yes, sir. It's right here on the screen. Okay. From the beginning. And we're going to zip through what we've already covered. So we're going to get through all of this. And we're going to narrow it down to kind of where we were at here. We're picking up, uh, that's where we covered there. And uh, we, were, we were right over here. God, Michael, this stuff was so interesting. At this these point photographs right here. Now, just confirming, we left off on Elvis's plane. Okay, yeah. Correct? We did, yes. Okay, so that's where we were. And uh, we're going to continue on here. And I think uh, what we'll talk about here is we'll talk about Aztec, New Mexico, March 25th, 1948. Now, this is a very controversial case because there's a huge backstory behind it. There's some disinformation behind it. There's a couple of crooked figures in this case. But if it wasn't for the research of Scott and Suzanne Ramsey, we wouldn't even be talking about this case. And it's interesting to note that even Stanton Friedman, our late good friend Stanton Friedman, admitted that more research, blood, sweat, and tears had been poured into the Aztec New Mexico case than anyone had ever poured into Roswell. That's an interesting little statement. So even Stanton Friedman admitted this, that, that both Scott and Suzanne Ramsey ha have put more research into this case than anyone has put into Roswell. So that's why I think it's important that we cover this. Now, this is the cover of their first book, Aztec Incident, recovery at Hart Canyon. And you can see this is like the location where this came down, the actual location. So it's got these low shrubs. It's kind of a desert terrain. This is about 16 miles northeast of the town of Aztec, New Mexico. And we'll, we'll get into some of the details as we go on here. This, this is the map 
that shows you how to get to this location here. Site of Saucer Crash, 1948. Here's Aztec, New Mexico over here, and we'll continue on. This is the breakdown, March 25th, 1948. And this craft was 99.9 .9 feet in diameter, so it's just shy of 100 feet in diameter. It had a bubble, kind of a half bubble canopy or dome on top, a smaller one on the bottom, and then six circular porthole windows wrapped around the outer circumference of that upper dome section. That's what we want to talk about as we move through here. Now, it's important to note that when this craft came down, the oil field workers got there before the military did. So now you can see the oil field workers kind of going up on the outer disc of this craft itself and moving toward the forward portion of these windows and they're looking inside the windows. And so that's what we'll move on to next here. Now this is a scale model that uh, Scott had built, for, um, had built for himself. And you can see this little dome on top, uh, the outer rim, and it would, it's a large walk just to get to this outer rim here. So now what they discovered was a quarter size hole in one of these about 19 to 20 inch diameter porthole windows. So they went back to their oil field truck. They poked a pole through one of these circular openings and they were jiggling it around. And so, oh, excuse me, Michael, they yes. were able, they were able to poke a hole right through this. this well, it, it, it already had a quarter size hole inside it already. That okay, was the gotcha. only damage that was seen on the craft itself. All right. So, once they poked that hole through, or they uh, put the pole through there, they were jiggling it around and they activated some type of a device which allowed them to gain access to the upper dome of the craft. And when they got there, what they found was two alien bodies slumped over on seats. One was slumped forward on a control panel. There were button switches, dials and levers. There was iconology purple colored, violet colored iconology written on the inside wall of the craft on the upper dome. So there was two there. And then they also discovered on the main outer hull of the craft embedded within the outer rim, there were another 14 bodies for a grand total of 16 bodies that were recovered. And that's what you see here. This is the re retrieval operation. By this time, the military was called on site and the oil field workers didn't know what was stranger was it the dish-shaped craft that was strange or was it this army helicopter that did one orbit around the scene and then departed because this is back in 1948 helicopters were a novelty back in 48 so they didn't know what was weird this is according to scott ramsey and so here now, you michael, can see the, yeah uh, now michael um according to this drawing that uh, there's like 12 bodies here yeah uh, is that is that in keeping with the data that we have? I mean, yeah, yeah. According to Scott Ramsey, there were 16 bodies recovered. So you can wow. see they're pulling the bodies out of the craft now, and they're almost done with the body retrieval. So there's a little bit more to go yet. Wow. But that is what uh, is stated within the book and the reference works. So we're we're going with what uh, has been stated previously. Now, how do you move? a 99.9 foot diameter disc shaped craft. Well, they figured out that there was a pin device that when you deactivate it, the whole craft pops apart into three equal pie segments. And then they really? strung cables across the desert, wrapped it around the bottom rim of, the, of these segments, and then dragged those across the desert. And then they loaded those up onto M25 tank transporters called a dragon wagon and they brought them to Los Alamos where they were reassembled and the reverse engineering program began at that point. And so in a nutshell, that is the Aztec UFO crash retrieval. That's just amazing that we have this data. Um, we have these testimonials from people. Right. And yeah, because Scott interviewed the last of the surviving oil field workers and uh, he got that information from, from those last of the surviving witnesses. Now, was he able to talk to any, ever get in touch with any military people that 
uh, were on the scene or is it just the oil field workers? Well, there is some evidence to indicate that uh, Mr. Feynman, who was involved in the Challenger investigation, he was involved in this. Wow. And the Atomic Energy Commission is involved in this. And so once again, we hear that it's not the U.S. Air Force that's driving the cover up and the reverse engineering program. It's the United States Navy in conjunction with the Atomic Energy Commission that's driving this whole thing. And, you that's know, that's, yeah, that's, that's just ironic, but it, could, it was the Department of the Navy just this past few years that are finally coming forward with things like the Tic Tac UFO and others. Um, right. Their their voice is being heard, I think, more so than other other military departments, other, you know, the Army, the Marines, mm -hmm. Air Force. Wow. Yep. Yep. So uh, we'll continue on here, and we're going to talk about Kingman, Arizona, UFO force landing, May 18th, 1953. Now, two things to remember. Number one, the senior researcher on this particular case is Harry Drew. Credit goes to Harry Drew for pulling out this information. Second thing is that this was not a crash retrieval. This was a forced landing. So there was no damage to the craft whatsoever. It had flown through a high-powered radar range at Kingman Army Airfield. And when it did, because they had jacked up the power to a very high level, and there were reports that when birds flew through this radar range, they dropped dead immediately to the ground. That's how powerful this range was. And so when this 30-foot diameter dish-shaped craft came through this range, somehow the navigation system of the craft was disabled and it made a forced landing. So this thing is 30 feet in diameter, 14 feet tall. It had these ridges along the outer rim of the craft that came around the outer circumference, and then there was a hatch on the bottom of the rim itself. And we need to talk about this interesting point. There were approximately 35, about 30 engineers that left Indian Springs biplane and they flew to Phoenix. And again, this is 1953. They boarded a General Motors bus with another 10 particular scientists and expertise personnel. So there was about 40 personnel on this bus. They left Phoenix. It was late at night. And you can imagine they were on a long, dirt, dusty road, unpaved, and made it all the way to Kingman the very same night. But it was extremely late. And each particular engineer or specialist was let off the bus according to their specialty. And they all had to swear an oath of secrecy that they would not talk about what they were about to see. So we're going to drill down on what actually took place here. Now, Arizona Republic, November 18, 2016, they asked the question, did UFO crash in desert near Kingman in 1953? And that's what we want to look, uh, look at right here. So this is the scene when they pulled up. The Army was already at the location, and you can see that there were four tents and multiple what are known as light alls that were shining down at about a 45-degree angle. The craft was tipped up at about a 15-degree angle and then augered in about 10 inches into the soil. It's not very much. No damage to the craft itself. There was some residual propulsion still going on within the craft. There were three humanoid bodies standing near the craft and then another one standing about 10 feet in front of those three for a grand total of four. And you can see this is approximately what they ran into when they got there. In the background, you can see this General Motors bus that the scientists left in order to investigate the craft. And then we're going to move on to the next slide here. And what they ended up doing, in, and this is done by Jim Nichols, they ended up building a wooden cradle for this craft they brought that onto an M25 tank transporter called a Dragon Wagon, similar to the other one that was previous to this. And then they started going down and eventually had to cross the Colorado River. Uh, but you could kind of see that they could not get across the Hoover Dam because the outer diameter of the craft itself was too wide for the road because there were light fixtures. So they went to the forward part of the Hoover Dam, about 200 feet north, where there's a pudding, and they brought a barge down the Colorado River, 
and they drove this tank transporter with the craft on top onto this barge. They strung two cables across from one side to the other and proceeded to pull this barge across. And then, Jim, the cable snapped. And this craft, with the dish-shaped craft on it, started floating down the Colorado River and actually impacted the north wall of the Hoover Dam. And now that the level is so low, wow. we should be able to see a mark on the Hoover Dam where this craft That's actually incredible. made an impact here. That's incredible. And uh, it was a very chaotic scene because it was at night. Uh, there was screaming and yelling and chaos. They had to get this thing secured. Uh, they finally made it to the other side. We're going to do an enlargement here. We'll do one more enlargement. And that gives you a good idea of what this thing looked like as they were pulling it across to the other side. Mm. All of this information can be seen in this book by Harry Drew called Seven Days in May, The Kingman UFO Story. Eleven UFOs, one UFO landed, two UFO crashed, 44 ETs, six taken alive, four taken dead, two taken to sheriff's office and escaped. 44 ETs. Yeah, that, there, there's a lot more involved with this particular case than just the one we considered. And that's all basically encapsulated into Harry's book. He, he did just this, such a fantastic job on it. This is just absolutely amazing. 44, do we have any idea where this craft is from? Do any rumors? I, any? I don't think that Harry has that information. I don't think they know. Uh, I could be wrong, but... As far as I know, they don't know where it came from. Now, the engineers who rode the bus, you know, four, five, six hours to get there, they were told that they were going to be looking at a top secret U.S. aircraft. And that's all they were told. That's all they were told. <laughs> uh, one other side point. The military established some type of communication with these beings because there were four beings. And they asked these beings if they would go with the U.S. military. And the beings replied that we will go with you on one condition and one condition only, that you do not separate us. And that's the agreement that they made. And that's exactly what happened. Well, so six taken alive. Six taken alive. That was from another crash retrieval and within we know, the same time frame. Because this was a multi-day event here. And do we know what happened to these six i know i realized it was there this one talking, 1953 there, here there was according to harry drew one was brought to the kingman arizona uh downtown jailhouse and under the courtroom there's a secure building or kind of a, a basement area that has no windows very thick concrete walls has a very thick door with a lock on it so this humanoid being was put in there the lock was locked up door was shut and there, again, there's no windows. There's no way to get out. A guard was posted there. And then when some other officials got to the facility about 10 minutes later, they opened up the door and it was gone. Serious. Whatever or whoever was in there somehow escaped. And we have no idea how. Bring me up, Scotty. We have no idea how. So let's continue on here. Homestead Air Force Base, February 19th, 1973. Now, this is the famous... Uh, Jackie yeah. Gleason and our our very good friend, former President Richard Nixon, yeah. 1973, were at a golf outing. And that that is true. They actually were there. This is the uh, <clears throat> open that they had, February 19th, 1973, charity golf outing in Florida. You can see Jackie Gleason with his ever-present uh, carnation on his suit. Uh, and then Richard Nixon looks like he's just getting ready to shoot here, or he already uh, had his putt. And uh, we'll move down here that the story is somewhere around the ninth hole, the subject of UFOs came up, and Jackie Gleason was a huge UFO paranormal buff. He had thousands of UFO books. He was well known to be interested in UFOs. His house was in the shape of a UFO called the Mothership. He had a huge interest. So he said to the president, uh, Mr. President, uh, can you help me with this? Is there something that you could tell me about this? And the uh, president said, well, if you'll be available later in the afternoon, I might be able to assist you with this. And so uh, when it was later in the evening, 
president shows up without the Secret Service, mm -hmm. and there's a knock on the door. Jackie Gleason opens the door, and it's the president. And the president says, well, uh, Jackie, remember we were talking about earlier? And he said, yeah, I do. He said, why don't you come follow me? So Jackie Gleason gets into the passenger side of Richard Nixon's car, driving alone. They go to Homestead Air Force Base. They're met by a guard. They're escorted into a facility on the far end of the base. And when they get there, they see five, approximately five to six vintage coat freezers. Each one contained the mangled remains of a childlike burnt body that was about three and a half foot tall, oversized head, oversized, you could call them gangly, thin arms, thin legs, slit for a mouth, minute nose, no hair. And these bodies looked like they were in a crash, no doubt about it. Uh, also nearby, there were four bins with debris inside. So he actually saw the debris and the bodies. And we'll move forward here. You can see this is what these coat freezers look like, almost identical to these. And this is what they stored? I mean, yep, something this, this is what they stored them. Yep, this is what they stored them in, coat freezers. They look very similar to this. And here's Jackie looking inside, and he was a changed man. He was absolutely a changed man. Uh, he got home that evening very late. And his wife, Beverly McKittrick at the time, basically said, where have you been? And he kind of laid out the story, and he was never the same after that. He was never the same. Has after anybody that. ever uh, talked with his wife, uh, Beverly, did you say her name was? Well, she, she wrote a manuscript called The Great One, which was never published. And this story was supposed to go into that manuscript, but it was never published. So we okay. don't have any written details about this. This is this is all we have, you know, right. basically uh, from his ex-wife describing this. But there's really no paperwork to back this up. Now, Clark McClellan, years ago, 86, interviewed Jackie Gleason in his car, and he laid out this whole thing. And when you read the account, to me, it sounds legitimate. It sounds like it actually did happen. Now, who was that? Uh, uh, Clark McClellan was a space expert, and he knew the astronauts. And uh, he got a meeting with Jackie Gleason in his own car at a bus stop, and it's it's written about in his book. And this case is described in great detail. And the way they lay this out, it just sounds legitimate. It really does. Again, it's hard to prove because we have no physical evidence, but keeping in mind the other ca crash retrievals as well and where they keep this, the other personnel involved, it's all connecting. The dots are lining up. I guess at the time they thought stuff like this would panic the public. I suppose it would have. Yeah, well, it affected him for sure. Yeah. So I started digging here, and I thought, well, is there any evidence that I can pull up? So I found this Fort Lauderdale News, February 1st, 1973. Super golf with superstars, and here's Jackie Gleason. So that checks out. February 19th okay. 20, uh, through the 25th, that checks out. That checks out. This is the enlargement. So this event did happen. He was Whether there. He the bodies, that's another question. But the, the golf outing did happen. Here's Jackie Gleason driving oh, the, yeah. the okay. golf cart. So we know that it did happen. No doubt about it. He was there uh, with the president. No doubt about that. So then I started tracking, um, could this actually have taken place in the time frame that was alleged? And you can see here it's 38 minutes, 28.8 miles, and this would have been back in 1973. Now, around 11 p.m., there would have been nobody on the road at that time in 1973. So you could probably shave off another eight minutes. So they could have made it from Miami to Homestead in 30 minutes. They could have spent 10 minutes at the facility and drove back in just over an hour. It's doable. Sure. It's within the theoretical limits of uh, believability. So it's certainly possible. Uh, Dayton Daily News, May 14th, 1993. Jackie Gleason claimed that Richard Nixon took him to Homestead Air Force Base and he viewed alien bodies. That's written about in a book here, and it isn't just Jackie Gleason. So what else do we have? The Times Tribune, July 5th, 1987. In her unpublished biography of the funny man entitled The Great One, 
Beverly Gleason's second spouse described a bizarre trip Jackie took with then president in 1973 to Homestead Air Force Base in Florida to see what she says were the bodies of four dead space aliens recovered by the Air Force. Wow. It goes on here. The Times Tribune, March 15, 1985. Larry Bryan, who is director of the organization, which is Citizens Against UFO Secrecy, wrote back that there have been reports that McDill Air Force Base Tampa, Langley Air Force Base Virginia, and Homestead Air Force Base Florida near Miami have all served as way stations or temporary repositories for crash saucer artifacts. So Jim, there are your three places right there. There's your three places. Well, that's just amazing that, you know, Michael, I don't know how, <laughs> I don't know how you do it, how you dig this stuff up, but this is, the, I, I'm, I'm speechless right at the moment, I guess. Well, we also have, there is some evidence to indicate that there is a UFO stored at CIA headquarters, and there's also one UFO stored at the Vatican. Okay. They've got something to that. So there's a whole story behind that as well. Now, uh, we want to talk about UFO crash retrievals. We want to highlight Leonard Strainfield. We had mentioned them at the beginning part of our series on UFO crash retrievals. He coined the term UFO crash retrieval back in 1978. So credit has to go to Leonard Stringfield. Here's his book, The Complete Investigations from 1978 to 1994. I recommend getting this book for anyone who's interested in this subject matter. It's about a $75 book. Can you pull it off of Amazon or something? Or? Yep, you can get it at Amazon. It's available there. And all of his status reports are combined into one volume. And that's this one right here. UFO mm -hmm. crash retrievals, yep. the complete investigation status report. Wow. That's correct. That's correct. And they're all there. So if you want to get the inner details, of all of the bodies and the craft that recorded, where they went, where they took them, who was involved. Now, there's a couple of problems here, though. In order to maintain an important part of our national history, the agreement that Leonard made with his witnesses and sources is that they could tell the story, but they couldn't reveal their identity. So there are... There are no names for us to follow up on. Very Now, there are some, but there are no names to follow up on because those names were kept private by Leonard Stringfield. And a lot of these cases are 40, 50, and 60 years old. We're almost too late, Jim. Too much time has gone by. Well, I mean, I, I think it's wonderful that we have this. No, we got something. We got something. We, we, yes, we've got something here to go by. So my crusade has been for the last... 12 years now, is to take the cases within this book and commit those to professional, high-quality illustrations and drawings, because this is a very wordy book. And this that, is not something you can knock out in a weekend. This is a, a, a multi-week, you know, investigation when you get this right. volume. There's a lot of information there to digest, and it's all text. There's no pictures. There's no drawings, very little illustrations. Well, and you're that's, certainly the guy to do it. Well, I hope so. And that's <laughs> what this book needs. And so that's what I've you know, committed my life to is getting these cases illustrated so that we can see what these things look like. And that's what I want to show you as we move on here. Uh, Lunkin Airport, Cincinnati. This was the original home for the 65 three ring binders that came from Leonard Stringfield's uh, secretary. And these are her inter-office secretarial notes. Later on, everything was moved to Orange County, but then everything was moved back to Cincinnati. So once again, they are here at this location that you see right here. And just to let you know, uh, back in 2012, I was given access to all of the 65 three ring binders. And uh, this is boots on the ground research. I'm taking you inside the facility now. This Hangar is at Lunkin, Lunkin Airport. That's correct. And these are the file cabinets. And you see I've laid out some of the three ring binders on the floor. And just to show you that th this is real world boots on the ground research. Th this is not research by going on the Internet and recycling junk and garbage that other people have done prior to. This is real world research, digging down into the cabinets, into the bank boxes and pulling out the information. That's 
that's the, the hallmark of a true researcher is what we're doing right here. So what is in here? Uh, well, I want to highlight my good friend Rudy Gardea, who has done a tremendous job at drawing these cases. So we meet every Saturday in Oxnard. We get all the information, all of the sketches that we can put together, all of the reference material, all the text, put that all together. And these are the results that we came up with. And that's what I want to talk about here. So Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. And we'll kick this off here. 1946. This was a private who was involved in records management. And the source is Space, The Final Frontier, page 59 by Clark McCollum. Now, keep in mind, this is before Roswell. We're already talking about crash retrievals prior to Roswell at Wright Field, Dayton, Ohio. It had not even been Wright-Patterson Air Force Base yet. That didn't happen until October 1957. It was still Army Airfield at the time. So this private, he has to deliver a letter to a particular hangar location. And when he gets there, he's met with a friend of his who is an MP. And this friend said, you know what? I think I've got, and this is on page 59 by his book, Space, the Final Frontier. That's the reference for this. So this private records management personnel meets his friend who's an MP. They go into this hangar. They kind of walk near the back wall. And what do they see, Jim? They see a 15-foot diameter dish-shaped craft that's about seven feet tall. It has a series of cutout rectangular windows wrapped around the outer circumference of the craft. Now, this flat section around the outer rim is about one foot six inches wide. There is a three foot diameter column that is starting at the bottom of the craft and goes all the way up to the top. There are no rivets, there's no wells, there's no seams, there's no hatches, no control panels, and no seats. It's kind of like a antiseptically sterile craft. The exterior had this brushed aluminum surface that looked like it was molded. And then I don't know if you can see this, Jim, on your end. Do you see that red dot on the window? Yes, I do. Yes. Okay, good. That is the attempted point of entry. What they were doing is they were taking diamond tip drill bits and they were trying to gain access into this craft with the diamond tip drill bits. And that's something that also happened at the uh, very interesting location where the Marine tried to, uh, he was guarding a, a craft at a facility that he didn't even know where when he first got there. They were trying to do the same thing there that as well. That was in that, our, yeah, that was in our that part. That was in the first one, one where yeah. he started at Cherry Point, North Carolina, and then flew to right. another location. They were trying to get into that one too. So it's not an isolated incident. You can see what they're trying to do here. Now let's move forward here. Here is an uh, illustration that I came up with to give you an idea of what this thing actually looked like. And then we'll do one more here. And this is a drawing by Rudy. This shows you what it looked like. Off to the right, there was a tarp that was folded up. There was a toolbox nearby. And then there was an electric drill, vintage 1946, with a diamond tip drill bit inside the chuck of the drill. And a team had just probably about 30 minutes later stopped working. They put down this drill but they were trying to drill into this gym. So we've got a reliable report. We've got the paperwork references to back it up that even before Roswell, they had already began a retrieval operation. This thing came from Arkansas in a retrieval operation there and then was brought here by railroad car. And that's this case in a nutshell. Oh, yeah. Well, that drill looks like something that what we would call today a, a hammer drill. Yeah. Where you, yep. where you put a big concrete bit on the end of it and you hammer. It hammers as it drills. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Like, yep, so they were desperate to get inside here. Yeah. All right, let's keep on moving on here. Now, this is Salinas, California, July, August, 1947. This is at a carrot patch in Salinas, California. Again, sources Leonard Stringfield dictation notes. So if you can just picture what we've got here, we've just got this carrot patch in Salinas, California. This is right around the same time as Roswell. And uh, this is what we're looking at here. I've got a map that shows you what this thing looks like. This is an original sketch within the dictation notes. This craft was nine feet in diameter. It was four feet tall. Around the outer circumference of the craft, it had these indented look like windows inside the craft itself that had these ridges that were wrapped around the outer circumference. And then we'll go ahead and do a, uh, an additional illustration here. 
This is the map that shows you where this thing came down. So it's in the Northern California agricultural region on, a, on the way up to the Bay Area near San Jose, south of San Jose. But that's where this thing came down. So again, we're looking at the Roswell incident. We just covered a case prior to in 1946. So we can see this repeating pattern of these crash retrievals. Now, let's continue forward here. What does this thing actually looks like, look like? Here's the drawing by Rudy that shows you the retrieval operation. Now, the military did not get there until later in the day, which gave the two eyewitnesses time to walk around this thing, investigate it, look at it. But when they finally got here, the military, they had a six by six transport. They had a trailer, it was a flatbed trailer. They had a Jeep there. And then the military told these two primary eyewitnesses to exit the area immediately but they could still see the retrieval operation as it was going on. And again, this is about the same time frame as Roswell back in 1947. That's amazing. You know, with all this high technology that we see in these, these UFOs, mm -hmm. you, you have to ask, why did they crash? You know, I know. What, I know. What brought them down? That's the thing. That's the thing. Now, a number of these could be ours, or a number of these could have encountered some type of weather phenomenon, lightning, which exceeded the tensile strength of the aircraft, might have affected the propulsion system, navigation system. I guess there's a whole series of reasons why they come down, but they're coming down, whether they're ours or not, they are coming down. Yeah. And uh, all roads lead to the places that we had talked about previously in the other slide here. Now, let's go on to this next one here. This is the Sierra Madre Valley, California, prior to 1951. I don't know the exact date. It was not recorded within the testimony within the Stringfield uh, collection. This is page 32, and this involves a construction worker who was on the site when something came down. The United States government flew in a C-119 flying boxcar. They brought this... Uh, plane to a, a, a halt not too far from where this construction worker was, the military came over to the construction site and asked this worker, this is page 32, if mm -hmm. he would assist in the retrieval of this particular operation. So I said, Rudy, I want you to give me a C-119 flying boxcar. I want you to open up the F clamshell doors. And remember, we're talking about something that can't be any more than six feet across. So the diameter of the disc has to be 5.5 feet in diameter and no more so that there's clearance to get in. And I want you to show this craft being loaded into the aft end of the C-119 and here's what he came up with. Uh, this shows you the interior here. This is a view looking aft toward the uh, aft clamshell door. So no, that's the actual, that's an that's actual- That's the actual order. interior okay. of the flying box car, yeah. yes. Okay. So you can see it, it can't be a large craft. It has to fit inside here. Exactly. And so here's the drawing that Rudy came up with. The individual who was uh, the primary witness on this, he said that there were two bodies recovered. They were highly burnt. And when he touched the face of one of these beings, the skin just peeled away. So there was some type of crash. Apparently bodies were recovered. They were severely injured. And this is sometime prior to 1951 in the Sierra Madre, California mountain range. I wonder, and I wonder if it could have been some sort of, uh, now I've heard theories that possibly some of the radar equipment we were using in those days, uh, with, the, with the bodies being burnt, I mean, could it have been microwave or something? It's possible. It's possible. So it could have been a, a re-entry component. That might have been possible. Or there could have been a decompression event. We, we just yeah. don't know. Okay. Yeah. We just don't know. Yep. Okay, let's continue on here. The Pentagon, 1952, UFO crash retrievals, page 152, case one by Leonard Stringfield. So this involves a woman who was working at the Pentagon in 1952. She went down into the lower basement of the Pentagon. They do have a lower basement there. They absolutely do. Somehow, she kind of, don't know how she got there, but somehow she bumped her way into a doorway. And when she got into there, she was in a small room. It was darkly lit. It was dim. It was dusty. Uh, there were some boxes nearby. And 
as she turned 180 degrees, what she saw was a quote unquote pickled alien in a glass jar. About 10 seconds later, after seeing this, she felt a very firm hand on her shoulder. It was an MP ordering her to leave the vicinity immediately. So here, Jim, is what we came up with. And here we can see this uh, woman who was the primary eyewitness. She said she saw a pickled alien in a glass jar at this underground vault location at the Pentagon. So when we hear these congressional hearings that the United States government doesn't have any debris or bodies or crash retrievals or UFOs. Yeah. Here yeah. we have multiple cases of retrievals, reliable eyewitnesses. So it's their word against the governments, actually. And of course, if this thing is truly pickled, then he's he's probably still around today. He could still be around today. Who who knows how long it had been there already? Yeah. It could have been there five, ten years prior to. Very yeah, possible. Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Let's continue on here. This is kind of what it might have looked like. Uh, this is by my friend Joseph Wright, just to give you yeah, an idea scared what, anybody. what it may have looked like. Correct. All right. Next one. Wright Patterson Air Force Base, 1953. This is a warrant officer. Source UFO crash retrievals, page 15, abstract number eight. And on this particular case, these, uh, you could call them a, a, this was a transient pilot who was basically going down the area of where the hangars are at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And his job was to keep his fellow pilots in shape. And so they were looking for racquetball equipment. They kind of went into this hangar that had an open door. And what did they see inside? This is kind of giving you an idea of what the hangar might have looked like. Uh, yeah, this is... I have to back up. This is a, a particular different case, which we're going to talk about here. Again, this is 1953, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, this warrant officer was at the right place at the right time when a DC-7 came into the base. It taxied into the hangar. The hangar doors were shut. And then there was a port cargo bay door that opened up. They had a forklift that lowered the forks down to the ground inside the hangar. So this gives you a very accurate uh, depiction of what this looked like. And there were five crates on the pallet. Three of the crates were open. They had their lids open. And inside, this warrant officer was about 12 feet away. He was able to lean over and look down, and he saw three small statured, quote-unquote, human-looking alien bodies that were about three and a half foot tall. They had oversized head, basically hairless, oversized eyes. They were all dead. One was female, slit for a mouth, minute nose. And just to give you an idea what this looked like, here's Rudy's drawing of what this scene looked like. And one interesting point of this is that he said that the bodies were suspended off the bottom of the wooden crate by a fabric that protected it from freezer burn of the dry ice inside the box. And that's, oh, that's from a, a detail. warrant officer yeah. in 1953 at Wright Patterson Air Force wow. Base. So he got to see it. He got to see it. It's his word against the government. And what I find interesting is all of these congressional hearings, the people that are having these hearings, they're not even cleared for this information. So how can they declassify it if they don't have access to it? You They're know, so was, far behind on all this. I was just going to say that, that with the congressional hearings and just as of recent, the, uh, the fellows who were from the Department of Defense or whoever they talked to, they, they acted as though they had no knowledge of any of this stuff. They, they don't have a high enough security clearance to be read in on these programs. They don't have a need to know, I guess. They don't have a need to know. And so how how can they have any congressional hearings and state that they're going to make an impact or make a difference when they don't even have access to this information? Yeah, yeah that's, that's uh, yeah, okay. It doesn't make any sense. It really doesn't. Uh, let's move on here. The other Roswell. 1955, across the Texas-Mexican border, Del Rio, Texas, and this is by Noe Torres and Ruben Urarte, uh, who's a very good friend. And he's took yeah. time to speak to me. 
I'm, I'm sure you know him as well. I know uh, this Ruben. is their book that they put together, and it's uh, it's an incredible case. It's an incredible case. Now, there were approximately two B-47s that were heading westbound uh, across Texas, and there were four F-86 Sabre jets that were flying chase with them, heading westbound. All of a sudden, a dish-shaped craft comes screaming by, heading eastbound over Texas. It started sparking. And then it crashed just south of the Texas-Mexican border, south of the uh, Rio Grande River. Mm. And this is very similar to what the scene actually looked like. You can see the thing caused a mark as it came in. Some debris came off the craft as it crashed in. So this F-86 pilot, he got clearance to peel away from the group. He did one pass, and then he was allowed to land at a nearby field where he rented a... A small single engine tail dragger and they flew with one other person to the site itself and I want to take you there this is an Aranka high wing tail dragger I want to take you to the scene here is the map that shows you where this took place on the upper portion here you can see Del Rio as we go down you can see the Rio Grande River and then just south of the Rio Grande in this location right here this is where the craft came down Wow so these low shrubs uh, bushes, kind of like a desert terrain. And so at this point, I want to take you to the retrieval operation. And here's what Rudy came up with. Over on the right side, you can see the Aranka. Over on the left, top left, you can see the Jeep. You've got the uh, six by troop transport. Here's the craft that came in, uh, some debris off of it. Now he did say that the dome on this thing popped off and it was getting cold later in the evening. And so the Mexican military personnel, because this was a retrieval operation that was going on by the Mexican military, the soldiers were putting blankets over the debris to warm them, and then they took the blankets off the debris and put them onto their bodies to keep warm. That was a very interesting historical remark by the gentleman who flew the Aranka there. He was there. He saw this whole thing. Wow. Well, and this is all in um, in Ruben and no reason. this is in this is in their book. This is in their book, but it, it needed a close up drawing just to give you an idea of what this looks like. So this is spring 1955. So by this time, they already had five or six of these things under their belt. So this is not a new operation. Uh, eventually, the military got involved. U.S. got involved, as they always do. Uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, 1955, Foreign Materials Division, UFO Crash Retrievals, page 17, abstract uh, 12 by Leonard Stringfield. So, what do we have here? We have a secretary whose job it was to record a thousand components from the interior of a UFO that was retrieved. And these materials were photographed, bagged, and tagged, and then she recorded it. That was her job. So let's move forward here, give you an idea. You can kind of picture this large warehouse, kind of the concluding scene of Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Yeah. You've got all these boxes. This may have been what it looked like because they had over a thousand components that they had salvaged from this retrieval operation. Let me take you into Warehouse Operations Building 258 at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. Very similar to what we're talking about here. So the site picture then is you've got a you've got a desk with a typewriter. You've got the primary eyewitnesses uh, witness who's recording all of this. Then you've got all of these boxes stacked up. Each one contains a part of the interior from the retrieval section of a UFO crash retrieval. That is our start picture. And so I want to go ahead and take you to the scene now. And this is what we've got. She also mentioned that there was a cart that uh, rolled right by her where there were two humanoid looking beings in these embalming fluid as this thing rolled by. And over to the left and right shelving, you've got all the components stacked up from the interior of one of these UFO crash retrievals. And these things were being photographed, bagged and tagged and cataloged. So the government cannot claim that they don't have any debris it's her word against the government, and this mm -hmm. was her final word. Uncle Sam can't do anything to me once I'm in my grave, end quote, because it was very near the end of her uh, 
end of her life. She said, hey, what do I got to lose? So she told her story six months later, Jim, she died. No kidding. Yep. Do we know how old she was? Um, probably in her late 70s, somewhere in there. Somewhere in there. Could have been her early to mid 80s, but somewhere in that time frame. But she was and, there. And, and what year did she pass? Well, uh, let's see. Uh, it's not mentioned in Leonard Stringfield's okay. report. That's but right. she just... she relayed the story of when she was there. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I mean, so again, it's a really word by, Yeah, she had nothing to gain by relaying she had, this. She story. had nothing. Yeah. Yeah. You know why? Why would she? You know she knew why, she was at the end of her life. Yeah. Why would you make something up like this? Towards right. The end of your, end of your life? Right. That's right. So let's move on to the next one here. This is right. This is the one I was referring to before. 1962, April, Wright Patterson Air Force Base. This was the group of transient pilot that walked into a hangar door. Inside there, there was a 15-foot diameter disc-shaped craft. It looked like a discus at a track and field meet. That's exactly how it was described. It was being propped up by two engine test stands. And later that day, when the leader of these transient pilots was questioned by the base commander, he said, uh, what did you see? And the guy replied, nothing. And, and this general said, good answer. And that's where it was left. Wow. So now we're looking at seven cases of them having the bodies, the craft, and the debris in their own custody. They've got it in their own custody. Well, Mike, we're out of time. We're out this of has time. been I know. This has just been the quickest hour. I'll tell you. you yep. Every time I've sat and talked with you on my program, you I'm just captivated. And for those listening, uh, if you don't get a chance to see this, see the visual on this. So mm -hmm. in other words, you know, a lot of people just come on to uh, come on to Dark Window and they just they get the audio portion of it. You are missing a large part of this program by not being able to uh, access the whole the whole show. But anyway. Um, Michael, thank you very much for joining no us. No problem. We're, we're gonna. This is part three. We're gonna do a part four, and a sure. part five. We're gonna keep going until there's more our, to go. There's more there's to go. More, oh, there's absolutely. So I just want to say that. Uh, tell everybody. I want to say to everybody, thank you for joining us tonight, and um, we look forward to another fascinating uh, program with Michael. And along with, and so uh, I'm your host, Jim Mann, and along with me, of course, is my program manager, uh, Patricia Wilkinson. And so, on behalf of all three of us, Michael Schratt included, I want to say thank you. And uh, this is KGRJ, this is KGRA Digital Broadcasting, and our program, Dark Window. And thank you for joining us, and good night.